being here. And thank you all for being here this morning. It's a Saturday morning. There's a hundred places you could have been, and um, we're glad you're here. Um, thank you to the Arts House for organizing this. Um, you always do a great job of bringing writers in from around the world, and um, today is no exception. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll kick off by, by introducing our panel, because I think even though um, a lot of us are familiar with them, it's just good to remind ourselves um, of what we can, the viewpoints we can expect from their background. So let's start with Yangzi. I had the opportunity to, um, to speak with Yangzi last year at the Singapore Writers Festival in a panel around ghost stories. Um, and we just spent a few minutes um, chatting about that, <laughs> about that again. Um, Yangzi's first book, uh, The Ghost Bride, has, uh, has the distinction of being on Oprah's um, Book of the Week. For, and as well as um, just a whole list of accolades here, um, which include being a Carnegie Medal nominee, a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers pick, um, and Good Housekeeping Magazine's book pick as well, and Glamour Magazine, I Never Travel Without. Um, and it's set in 1890s colonial Malaysia, if you haven't read it, and the elaborate, um, it's all about um, the elaborate Chinese afterlife with its ghost cities and bird paper offerings, and it's about a, Chinese, a young Chinese woman who receives a marriage proposal from a dead man. So um, it's, a very, it's a very interesting theme around, um, around ghost marriages and something that, um, that Yangzi gets to explore um, a, a lot when she does these talks. She says quite often people come up and say to her, I have this story to tell you. And, and so hopefully some of you will have something to share later as well. Um, Yangzi um, also blogs um, at ysq.com, so if you'd like to read her, her ongoing writings, you can reach her there. Um, and then in the middle we have Pat Ladd, who really needs very little introduction. Um, when Lisa called and said, would you do this, I was like, of course, <laughs> you know, I would rearrange around this because this is, um, this is a man who I've, I've known since I was a kid, you know, from, from reading Kampong Boy and all his other writings. So there's 20 volumes of cartoons published since he was 13. And um, his, you know, his works take a really good comedic look at Malaysia's um, social and political life. Um, and Kampong Boy, I think, is something that a lot of us have grown up with and, and hold very, very dear. Um, and he has the title of Dato, but has said it's okay for me to call him either Abangla or Pakla. So, <laughs> I should be respectful and just call him Pakla. <laughs> Even though I want to give him a great big hug and call him Abang. <laughs> so, um, and Dina. Dina and I had a chance to, uh, to meet last year at the Writers' Festival as well and have some conversation over lunch. Um, Dina's an award-winning writer of non-fiction, fiction and poetry. And she's most recognized for her bestseller, I'm Muslim. It's a book that explores the complexity and wonders of faith. So she's got a strong international media presence. She's been on um, a lot of the major international broadcasters, including BBC and Al Jazeera. And she's currently a columnist with the Malay uh, Mail Online. She deals mostly in the topics of religion, culture, and public policy. And I think what we've got here, credit to the Arts House again on this, is a panel that can really bring to life the diversity that is Malaysian writing and, um, and really sort of, you know, uh, bring, it, bring a lot of different perspectives to the table. So I'm going to start with a question, which is perhaps the same question for all of you, and just to give you a sense of, of how we'll do this. I'm quite happy for us to keep it discussive, so if you have something you want to jump in and say, that's fine too. If not, we've, we've left some time at the end, about half an hour at the end, for all of us to, to, um, to throw some questions at them, so it's not just me that gets to do this. Um, so the first question, and perhaps we'll start with you, Dina, is if you could describe Malaysian writing as a person, how old are they, and what are some of their characteristics? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> how would I describe uh, Malaysian writing? Yeah. Are they teenagers? Is, is Malaysian writing, and uh, you know, still in its infancy, or a young, mature, young becoming a mature adult? I would say that Malaysian writing is on its way to becoming an adult, but it's not a teenager either. Um, it's still trying to find its way. Um, but we're getting there, you know, we have to see our shrinks, life coaches, figure out things. But uh, we are there. We do slip into infantile tantrums once in a while. But I think that's needed. We need that kind of uh, 
and some anger too, because we are still exploring. So I would say that we are on the brink of adulthood. Great. Kaklat, what, what's your take on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually am really the odd one here because I, I am a cartoonist. And, uh, <laughs> so this, this is where, where I'm supposed to attend. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and that's because, why you're here, not in spite of being a cartoonist, oh, because yeah. you're a cartoonist. Yeah, so my, uh, as far as drawings are concerned, you know, my drawings, uh, each page would do 95% of the story, and uh, maybe 5% is just a bit of uh, caption or Usually, the pictures uh, tell the story themselves. So, uh, you know, uh, the uh, literature involvement that I am in or have been in uh, it was very minimal. But, uh, you know, if I were to look at Malaysian literature, then I would have to go back to where when I started uh, in the 1950s uh, reading the novels and so on, very old fashioned and uh, People like Basako, uh, Shahadi Muhammad, uh, you know, and then we had uh, Saman Ismail and uh, Shanun Ahmad, of course, came later. Uh, we had many writers who were writing about the, that period, uh, which uh, today is not really very well known. And uh, the young ones today go for very global uh, material. And uh, I think uh, uh, they write. Uh, short, short uh, stories more, you know, the information uh, that they give is almost like, uh, you know, they would prefer just as uh, less uh, lines, less words, uh, you know, in every, uh, it's, it's like them sending messages, you know, to each other when they write a book. Uh, so, it, you know, um, as somebody from the 20th century, I find that it is, uh, way beyond my understanding uh, in today's uh, writing. Um, but I can tell that, uh, you know, the materials uh, that are written, I can tell the age. You know, somebody, if I, if I see a short film, if I see a, a, a movie uh, that's done today, uh, if I see a novel or a novella, no, novella right? uh, I can tell uh, how old uh, the writer is. Uh, if I see a short film, I know it's done by my daughter. You know, <laughs> she was so, so involved in some of that. Uh, and I told her, don't, don't, next time don't do anything personal, you know. You feature your dad also in there. That's not you, <laughs> she said. But uh, I, I know it's me. Uh, I know the guy is thinner, but uh, you know, it's, it's me. So uh, today's uh, Malaysian writing, I think is uh, past uh, catching up with the rest uh, of the world and I hope uh, they stay uh, with their own identity as much as possible. Mm. Great, thank you. Yes, what's, your, what's your view of that? Well, I think I have to agree with everyone. Um, I'm really excited that Malaysian writing seems very vibrant and very global now. When I was growing up, which was actually quite a long time ago, the, the thought of being a writer to me, it seemed very distant. You know, when I went to the school library and I looked at books, they all seemed to come from abroad. Mm -hmm. There are very few local books by local authors, besides Dr. Ba, who's I'm a big fan of, <laughs> anyway, um, that you would see in a school library that school, high school children would read. And I never really thought that I could become an author. Mm -hmm. One of the wonderful things um, about globalization and technology is that I think that a lot of young people nowadays feel that they can not only write, but publish and be heard. And so there's this upswelling of short stories, novellas, um, you know, kids make movies. I saw one, some made by some kids in Ipo, and it was their own movie came up. Um, and I also get, and I'm sure you do, lots of letters from aspiring Malaysian writers who say things like, I've written, I've written a short story, I want to write a book. Um, and it really feels they have a lot of hope and encouragement that the sky is the limit and that they can actually reach an international audience, um, which really never occurred to me when I was young. So I think that's, I think that's really great. 
No, it isn't. Touch the names, the, the Garden of Evening Mists, you know, it was a little bit of a turning point, I guess, for um, for Malaysian writing, making the, um, the Man Booker a uh, long list or the short list, actually. And, and so I guess if, if we pick up on that then, and, and we'll talk about the trends in Malaysian writing shortly, but where do you see the place of Malaysian writing in the global literary landscape? Any one of you who's, who's willing to jump on that one? Where do I see? Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. I will, if you don't mind, I'll talk about Malaysian nonfiction. Yes. Because I'm just so out Absolutely. of fiction. Yeah. I would say that, you know, we are coming up pretty well. Yeah. Of course, when you talk about younger writers, you can see that they're not very experienced in expressing their thoughts, the thing that they do. But because of the internet, right, and also because, you know, We've progressed. We have a very global mindset, and you can see how they view things, politics, religion, mm -hmm. you know, social issues. So I think we're coming up. I see a lot of fantastic essays by young writers now, mm -hmm. and the so-called okay, experienced ones. I will not say um, older ones, right? You will also see, unlike before, what is more parochial, very you know, very KL centric. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more references to you know international politics. So I think we're coming up, and I like that so when I read things. In my 20s, I used to think, okay, he's talking about the same old issues again and again mm -hmm. and again. But now in the last five years, yeah, I've realized that, my God, the writing is very, very good. They're making references that I don't even know, and I actually have to Google it. Who are they talking about? What are they talking about? I think for nonfiction, yeah, we're coming. But I wish there was a lot more, I mean, you know, I used to work for the Malaysian Insider, now with the Malaysian Insider. Because of, you know, the media, we have all these deadlines. Mm -hmm. Editors have no time to actually groom the columnists, who are actually the star makers of the, you know, if you don't know this columnist, yeah. you'll just be another newspaper. Yeah. I wish we had the time to actually invest in these people, because the work and the thoughts that they come up with are really valuable. Yeah. That we need that for archiving, you know, for the, the documentation of a national landscape. But you know, things are not so perfect in that way. But I, I'm actually very invigorated. I, I look forward. I become such a news junkie. And like before I sleep, I read. I wake up. And this is really unhealthy. <laughs> I, I am very inspired by the things that they do. Let's stay with that for a minute, Dina, because I had a question for you and we'll probably get to it now, which is, you know, the Malaysian political landscape of late has been dynamic to say the least and in some instances dramatic. Um, you know, so how do you, how would you say that's influencing um, the writing? And I think one thing, one, one place where we can pick up on that is also the medium, because if they're not being, if you don't have a big pool of writers being groomed as columnists, is the blogging scene taking off as, as the primary place for, you know, commentary? One thing about that I noticed, yeah, is that with writers in Malaysia, especially when you talk about, you know, non-fiction writers, we work in our little bubbles. We can be global, but at the same time we work in this little, you know, in our four walls, and we meet the same friends again and again, and I don't think that's very healthy. Mm -hmm. We need to expand and go. And sometimes you tend to see that, you know, these are the same players again and again they keep mentioning. I don't blame them. We don't have the time to run around. Those of us columnists, we have jobs, we have families, we don't exactly get to go out. Uh, I, how do I explain? I think also, much as, uh, you know, we are expressing a lot, yeah, I see a lot of anger among um, Malaysian writers, especially when we deal with politics. Like, Malaysian politics sometimes when I wake up, oh my god, it's, so, it's really schizophrenic. It can be like a circus. You don't even know what's going on. I mean, the last one month from the Cadbury thing to, you wake up like, hello, am I, this, in, am I a Malaysian? What am I living in? You know, why is my country changing by the second? I can't cope with it as a Malaysian. Uh, so we don't know how to use that anger and to write properly. Yeah? So, okay, I've become friends, I've got three friends who are psychiatrists, and I go to them as, okay, I really need this because I don't know how to channel that anger or my frustrations into 
a proper op-ed because I don't want to sound like a rant and say, this is how you compartmentalize. I'm lucky because I've got three friends who are always talking about this, that, this, and that, okay, I'm picking. But a lot of us writers, we don't have that kind of support. So the anger, the frustration comes. So sometimes the columns come out a bit iffy because it's all anger. But I don't blame them. We don't have that. We need that kind of support. Where we can say, where we come out, we can look at things from a distance and say, okay, this is what's happening, this is what we should do. But again, as I said, you know, we are feeling our way. You must understand that ISA was just what, dismantled how many years ago, yeah? So suddenly, you have the internet, everyone's going, yeah, we have the internet, we can write whatever we've we got. We've got a voice, yeah. We've got a voice, and we are not trained. How many Malaysians, right? And I'm not trying to do this to, you know, down or say anything bad about my countrymen, but how many of us were able, have been able to express? We only know how to do this, right? Okay, at least in my generation, we have literature. We don't have literature anymore. We do not have sastra Melayu. Mm. So we don't have compositions. We don't have that, those essays where it makes you question what Shakespeare is saying. Mm. We don't have that anymore. So we don't know how to write. We don't know how to express ourselves in a proper manner. Mm. Uh, workshops held you know, in Malaysia, but how many are affordable? Uh, we may, I mean, a lot of the workshops that we have in Kuala Lumpur are expensive, mm. but we try to. So is, is there a place there for um, for satire in um, in in this landscape? You know, where, where Dina says it can be frustrating and, and it can be hard to channel these things without. You know, getting too overwhelmed by the emotion. What satire's place in all of this? And you know, and, and do you see the next potluck out there somewhere? No, I don't see. No. <laughs> but, uh, You've left but, uh, you left know, me After know. listening to Tina, I think uh, your very good message is never marry a journalist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dina, you are you married? Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> But don't tell my wife, right? Anything, yeah? uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, there is, uh, if you uh, would like to uh, listen, uh, believe it or not, you know, there's uh, total freedom in uh, drawing uh, cartoons in Malaysia. You know, if you uh, read uh, uh, Malaysia Kini and so on, uh, you know, you find that there's, uh, there's no limit to what you can, as a cartoonist, you can draw. But I belong to the old, uh, you know, I, I'm conservative, you know, although I don't look like one, but uh, I, I've always uh, been uh, someone who draws very mild uh, drawing, and uh, uh, whenever I draw, it is uh, French, you know, and uh, it is uh, usually multiracial, it is usually um, international also, and that's why I always get invited to places all over the world because uh, it, it is uh, people handing, uh, you know, putting out their hands to shake your hand, you know, that, that sort of uh, relationship. Um, and uh, when I draw, I want people to smile, you know, which is difficult to do. Uh, if, uh, if you can make them laugh, of course, that's what you want to do. And you, you want them to feel uh, good inside, uh, you know. Um, I, I, I listened to your question, uh, you know, about Malaysia's uh, place, you know, uh, if it's uh, uh, books, then I think there are many, there is the Institute of uh, Tejumahan Negara, the, the Trans Translation Institute that has uh, many, uh, many times, uh, you know, introduced the Malaysian books uh, to the outside world and uh, outside books translated to uh, Malay. And they've done a good job. But then uh, before them too, you know, that we have a lot of our books that go abroad. My books have been translated to various languages, uh, 9, 10, 11 languages uh, all over the world. And, uh, you know, even uh, in uh, Portuguese and uh, Japanese, uh, Korean, uh, Dutch, and so on. But before we uh, we can be proud of our books going outside the world. We must have support from ourselves and uh, support from uh, our people. 
Support means support from Southeast Asia. You know, uh, wherever we are in this region, we have to support, you know, the writers, uh, the authors and the artists from this region. I will tell you a story about, a uh, short story again. No, uh, please don't worry. About uh, uh, me at the height of my fame in 1983. Uh, okay? I was at the topmost, you know, I was the most famous cartoonist in Malaysia at that time. Okay? I went to promote uh, some of my books in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So it's in a little place. And uh, I went with my colleague, Adiba Amin, the writer, you know, who wrote for the Straits Times. And I went with my distributor, a guy called Mirza. And uh, we ended up in this, uh, where I was supposed to have this meet the author, you know, uh, session. It's a bookshop, but it's a, it's a very ordinary bookshop. It, it doesn't look like orders or, you know. It's a, it looks more like a sundry shop, you know. So uh, there are books and we had two stacks of my book. You know, Kampong Boy, Town Boy, two stacks and I was standing in the middle. Uh, outside there's a little Manila card poster that says, Mint Clark. Uh, there was nobody, of course, uh, when, when, when the time came. There was nobody. It was in the morning like this. And uh, my distributor, Mirza, was hiding behind, uh, behind the pillar. <laughs> and <laughs> I was standing there. Adipa had her own uh, program. So uh, there was one man who came and spoke to me in Malay. So he was looking at these two stacks of books. They were on the floor. And he said to me in Malay, he said, uh, excuse me, uh, these books, uh, the author, uh, is he dead? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, he, he's still around. He, 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 he's still around. You, uh, what, what made you say that he's dead? What made you think he died? Uh, well, the, the, the stacks of books, uh, you know, uh, maybe he died and, uh, you know, the owner of the shop wants to return it to them to the family. Oh no. <laughs> oh no no no, this is a promotion, I said. Promotion of these books, you know, you, you buy this book, take a look. You know, it contains about story about the village, story about kids in, living in town, you know, it's, it's, these are nice books. So he picked one and he looked. He flipped through as if looking at a religious book, you know. And then the, I said, why don't you get one copy? I will, I will sign it for you. Oh, you sign one, uh, this book? Yeah, I'll, I'll sign it. I not put my name on it. There's only two of us here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I've forgotten whether he bought the book or not. But because I was so angry with my distributor without, you know, all this uh, publicity uh, beforehand. And so, um, no, you are not as popular as you think you are, you know, uh, it's in Southeast Asia. And so, uh, my trip, uh, uh, at that, on that occasion, I only managed to uh, come back with drawings about some places that I visited in that area and drew about it, you know, this seaside thing and uh, by the river. And uh, I think we have to, to support, you know, the, uh, the that's a good point. And Yang's a great place for you to interject because you don't write from, from here. You live outside of, of the region. Um, did you have to go away to be successful here? And did you feel that, that perhaps it was going to be a little bit harder here? Um, no, actually, in my publishing journey, it was a really a great surprise to me because I never thought that I would be published. Um, and I was just writing a book for my own amusement and the amusement of my friends and family, which is I think how many of us get started. Um, and I wrote about, um, I thought I would write about something that I knew about, and that was my childhood in Malaysia and this old house, which was falling to pieces. So my book is a lot about the Chinese afterlife, 
and about the burden of paper money. And a lot of that was inspired by this really old crumbling house that I saw in Penang called the House of a Hundred Rooms. And I was taken to see that house when I was a child by a friend of my aunt's who had access to it somehow. And it was a really eerie and strange mansion. It was built by a very wealthy Chinese man. It consisted of rooms and rooms and courtyards which were all broken. Grass was growing in the stones. And it was a complete ruin. In the middle of that, the, there were people squatting there. And they were living there, you know, basically living like beggars. And it turned out that they were relatives of the man who had built the house. And in a very, very, um, in one room, they were in a rotten chair, there was a very old Chinese man sitting there. And they said, he is the last son of the house. And I thought, that is, I think it was about 10 years old at the time. It really struck me like this is a terrible story. Something happened. And so years later, when I started writing books, um, well, I actually was just writing the stories for myself. I felt that when you read someone's writing, what's important to you is that it is authentic or it's something that they have seen or they've experienced. And I started to write the story of that house. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't that hard. Part of the reason is I write historical fiction. So anyone who's writing about historical fiction has to sort of imagine what certain things were. Um, but it's been very fascinating. Um, going back to your earlier question about Malaysian literature becoming global, I think that, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm very encouraged by this because when we talk about um, our works becoming global, we're mostly talking about them being in the English medium or translated into the English medium. And I actually had thought when I was growing up that why was it that most of the books we find in the bookstore, in English, about Malaysia, were all mostly written by non-Malaysians. I mean, you look up fiction about Malaysia, and then you get Somerset War, or you get Neville Shoot. Um, and so I am really, really excited that now when you look for books about Malaysia, they are written by people like Tan Tuan Eng and Tash Hall, yes, who I actually saw in New York at a um, book festival, and I recognized him from his photograph, and I was so starstruck that I actually I said, go on, you're on this panel, why don't you go and talk to him? And I sort of stood in the corner for a while thinking, oh, it's Tashkol. And by the time I came out, he had gone away. So I never did actually get to meet him. But I am um, really excited to be in this panel with Dina and with Dr. Blatt. And, you know, to go back to your books being universally appealing, when I went to university, I took two suitcases with me. And I had very few belongings, but two of the things in the suitcases were Kampong Boy and Boy, which I, I took with me, um, which I enjoyed a lot when I got home six. And, that, and that's a good place. I wanted a perspective on whether there is space, there is space in Malaysian writing right now, an appetite for it, writing and reading um, for stories from the past. Will Kampong Boy, will works like that still hold appeal, or or are we moving to, for example, more Dina space where? It's all about discourse about the now and what's happening with Malaysia now. What what do you feel about that? I mean, you write about folklore as well, so you know, is 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 there going to be space for that, or will people just want? What what are the trends you're seeing? Any anyone anyone of you? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go circuitously about this with okay. um, me. I think there's a lot of space for that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with Eddie Buku, who does a lot of heritage work in this area. Yeah. And through my work, I realized that a lot of Malaysians now, especially the younger ones, they have no sense of the history. Mm. So, you know, when I tell my young nephew, I brought your books, and I showed them Farhan, Baila, his, you know, lots of books. I grew up, I learned how to speak and write English through this cartoons. And for them, my niece is like, this is not my little pony. <laughs> yeah. They have no sense of history and they don't even know what a village is. It's like all yeah. about condos, all about this, all about iPads. And for us, you know, the writers, whether we write non-fiction or history and all that, we need to go back to that because I think Malaysians as become more and more, more wealthy or more educated. I don't know whether it's in our DNA, yeah, where and this is being slightly political, yeah? There is this thing in us that where we don't want to face or appreciate our old histories anymore. And 
this may be, okay, I'll just dive it a little bit. I sometimes wonder whether we Malay Muslims are the way we are now because we don't want that past, you know, where we think, okay, that's an old past, that's basically, you know, we don't want to have this village mentality, we don't want, so. There is a lot of space, and I feel that we need to go back to this. We need to go back to the last cartoons, our history, to say, this is who we are. But I suppose this happens everywhere else. I'm sure in Singapore, in Cambodia, nobody wants to look towards the past. We're just all about, you know, progress. Mm -hmm. I, I want to um, ask you, Pagla, about the medium, because you, you raised a good point about film, and, you know, and I think that what we are seeing, especially with the digital platforms, is that is the people are more inclined towards visual forms of, of uh, communication now and writing, you know, the threshold for lots of text has, has diminished. So do you, do you see that as being a trend with Malaysian writing, that we're moving more towards more visual storytelling, like more film and people writing for screenplays, rather than writing novels and novellas, perhaps? Uh, well, we go to the bookshops, uh, you know, we have the big film from and the LCC, you know, the, the full of books, and it's full of people. You know, we go to bookshops, it's always uh, people looking for books, uh, they, 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 they go for reading, you know, but, uh, but then uh, we have uh, other forms of uh, art that is uh, presented, uh, visual, uh, in uh, films and uh, in the graphics, uh, that are also uh, got very good following. So, in, uh, in my case, of course, uh, I choose this medium of uh, drawing because uh, that's what I've been involved in all along, and it's much easier to explain uh, something or to tell a story in a drawing form. And uh, it's uh, to an artist, uh, to someone like me, someone who draws pictures, the, the pleasure is great. You know, in creating one page of, of uh, the detail of drawing, you know, you uh, you go to the next page, you go to the next panel, and you have uh, characters, you have background, so that, that is so exciting. I once spoke to uh, Adi Balamin, the writer, uh, over lunch uh, in Bangsa, during our working days. Uh, she retired, of course, long ago, uh, I have retired also. And I asked her, oh, you, after this, we are going back to the office and you want to write, huh? uh, because uh, Write words, you know. Where are you going to get the words? You know, of course, she uh, she got words all over, and she can just speak the words, you know. And she said to me, "You going back to draw?" Yeah, but I said drawing is easy. You just draw. You <laughs> <laughs> need to, to look for words, you know. Uh, but maybe to some people who don't draw, maybe it's uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to draw, you know. So when you draw. Actually, these artists, you know, these illustrators and so on, these people who work in newspapers or magazines or uh, advertising companies, these illustrators, uh, they can draw uh, and then uh, they do, some of them do color and some of them do a lot of cross hatching, you know. Cross hatching is what you do when you draw the line and then you want to show some, some tone. So you dip your, your pen into the ink bottle and then you do cross hatching slowly. You, know, you do your cross hatching slowly, so your editor pass by and look, oh, it's really working. You know? <laughs> Actually, cross hatching means you are sleeping. You're not you know, you just cross, 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 but don't tell the editors, eh? <laughs> uh, you know, so this, uh, uh, it is much easier to reach out to the, uh, to the audience, uh, just like what, uh, I, 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 what happened to me at this, uh, when in 1974-75, I was at this chapati shop in, in Jalan Melayu, uh, near Ismail again. Uh, I was eating chapati and I saw on the wall uh, a picture of uh, a groom and a bride, you know, uh, 
obviously the owner of the shop, uh, you know, the son of the owner, but he was behind the counter. And I said to him, Ah, oh, that's, that's you. you uh, when you got married, yes. Ah, oh, you know, I just think, uh, I, uh, I'm from the newspaper. I want to do uh, a story on the Sikh wedding. You know? Uh, what sort of story? Well, you know, the, the process, you know, from beginning to end, you know, I, I'm going to do a funny story with drawings. And he said, oh, no, 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 no funny drawing, no funny story, our wedding, no funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, no, no, I, I don't mean that sort of drawing. I mean, I will draw in sequence, you know, what, what is the process from phase uh, one, you know, what, you know, the, the tradition, how it goes, you know, I'm, I'm blood, you know, I'm from the New States, I'm blood. You, you saw the drawing? No, I haven't seen the drawing. Uh, so I, I was trying to prove to him that I was an up and coming and talking. Okay. You, know? <laughs> yeah. uh, you see, if I do uh, an article uh, full of words or half a page of a newspaper on sick wedding, Nobody will read, say, uh, but if I draw pictures, I think people will yeah. read. Yeah, and then uh, by that time, he got tired of uh, listening to me. And uh, he said, this Saturday, there is a wedding at the Kampong Pandan Temple, a Sikh temple. Uh, you can go and you can look at the wedding, you can watch. Oh, but I, I don't have an invitation. To no need, no need. You cover your head. With a cross, and you can go. Nobody will chase you. <laughs> and did you? Yeah, I took the bus, the Tung Fung bus from uh, what we call Hoch Avenue in those days, and then we later call it uh, Jalan Sultan Muhammad. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, oh, it's a long story because I remember waiting in the bus, you know, without the driver, because the bus was stationary. And and he said some kampung pandan. And I waited a uh, long time and I said, here I am, you know, I'm trying to find something really new. It's a sick wedding, it's going to hit the new the new stand, and people are going to read all about it. I, I have uh, quite a number of sick uh, friends. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to surprise them. You know? I attended the wedding and uh, you know I saw from outside. And food were given, more chapatis. And then uh, there was one man with a bucket, with a bucket full of dal. Eh? Eat, eat plenty, eat plenty, eat plenty. So I, with my handkerchief here, and uh, next to me was a, a young Sikh uh, fellow who, uh, who I made friends with, and he was the one who did the running commentary of the whole thing. There was the bride, the groom, and there was the priest, there was a holy book on the, you know, on the pillow, a big pillow, and there was a fly whisk, and he was uh, you know, reciting, uh, you know, uh, all the holy words, and I was jotting down, I was doing some sketching, you know, I, I, in those days I wanted to prove to people that I was an artist, mm -hmm. you know, by, by carrying a sketchbook. So that, that uh, yeah, it, pub, it got published uh, and it went on for, I think, five days in the newspaper and it was a hit. There you go. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it is, uh, the Sikh uh, community were very happy. You know, I, I met uh, the Sikh uh, friends who said to me, oh, where do you get the story? Where do you get the story? But of course, uh, you know, I learned it as, from being uh, like a journalist mm -hmm. in the beginning. So it's uh, you, you got to get the real thing, like, like the experience you know, to, to, uh, to do it. And I think um, so that's a question I wanted to raise to all of you. I mean, some time ago we had a debate here, it got a little bit heated, on whether good writing could really um, come from order. And it was suggested by another Malaysian author, Shamni Flint, um, that Malaysians produce better quality writing than Singaporeans because um, it's born from some measure of chaos and disorder, which we don't have here. And so she said, so would you agree? And, and what would you say is the biggest influence of Malaysian writing today? Um, perhaps we'll start with you, Yancy. Oh, 
Oh, chaos and disorder. Well, <laughs> hmm. it is true that there is some chaos and disorder sometimes in Malaysia, especially you know, retrieving my luggage from a taxi once. Um, but I do think that is true. I, in some ways, people are more creative when um, when your environment is unpredictable. And when you actually do find different ways to get your point across, I think that's true. Um, and to sort of jump back to what Dina said, I also agree that if you do not know your past, you will not be able to find your future. So um, you need to have some sort of perspective on that. In terms of finding a voice, I think that um, I don't think we need to worry too much about new Malaysian, and let me speak about fiction writing since I don't know very much about non-fiction. Um, and I, I do think that people are challenged all the time. Um, it depends on how comfortable they are with it. For example, I write mostly historical fiction, but I also think that history, historical fiction is just another medium, just as um, cartoons are, and non-fiction or journalism comments are of showing or telling a story or making points. Um, and people have actually asked me before, why don't you write about current events? And I think the honest answer is because I am not based in Malaysia, I don't live on a daily basis. I'm not opening the Malay mail and saying, oh my goodness, you know, why is the price of, you know, what was it, Kong Kong? Why has it gone up again? Oh, I, I get the news late and I do read it online, but I'm not there and I'm not listening to my neighbors reacting because I, I do live abroad now. Um, and so I had told some friends, like, I don't think I can write with great authenticity about events that are unfolding day by day, minute by minute, but I can write about the past because a past is a lens through which you see um, another world or another story. And one of the things that I do think is interesting is that Malaysian writers are finally breaking away from, in some ways, the endless World War II stories that we produce. Not just us, but um, a lot of British colonial writers also wrote about the war, the Japanese occupation, and that was all that we were really seeing. Um, so I think it's good that we're moving away from that to different time frames. But um, as for Singaporean writers, I, I do have some friends who are Singaporean writers, so I think they're not saying too much about it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we'll keep it on the north, north <laughs> side of the causeway for now. <laughs> but they are doing very interesting work too. Yeah. <laughs> Dina, what do you think is, is the biggest sort of um, influence of Malaysian writing today? The biggest influence. Is it coming from a political space? Is it coming from culture, society? I think it's a mix. At least for me, the biggest influence, right, would be the people that interact. Because they tell me a lot of stories. So, um, of course, the work that I do is impacted and influenced by the politics of the country. But at the end of the day, I get to hear people's stories and they always tell me things. Mm -hmm. So those will be my biggest influences, people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then from there, I carve out an interview or a story or my experiences when I go out on the field. And somehow it seems to be related to the whole Malaysian political landscape. So, that, that is, that's, that's yeah, I think that's, it does seem as if that is driving the most, the most conversation, if you, if you like. Um, so, um, I'm going to have one last question before I turn it over to you guys to see if you have any questions for our writers. Um, and mine is, um, and I'll start with you, Pabla, um, who is the one Malaysian writer you think the world needs to know but probably doesn't? Uh, well, there are many, you know, so I, I won't be able to, uh, to uh, give you an answer because it won't be fair. And uh, <clears throat> a more important reason is that I'm not really a very good reader. So, uh, also I'm a very slow reader and uh, I, I, I won't be able to, uh, to recommend that. Uh, but if I do, then there are so many names, yeah. you know. Just like uh, the people who influenced me, there are many. Yeah. You know, we go back to the 1950s, 1960s. You know, I was reading all sorts of comics, yeah. all sorts of uh, cartoons, and uh, you know, uh, from uh, England, uh, from uh, from Britain.
Britain, uh, we had uh, you know, uh, comics like Andy Cap, mm. uh, we had Nemo and Dandy, and then from America, we, we had uh, Keenan's, uh, we also had Nancy, and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, you know, uh, humor, humorous uh, comics and cartoons. And th th there are so many of those people who drew them, uh, influenced me. Uh, of course, there is a great difference between British and uh, American humor. Uh, you know, the British, uh, the more stupid you are, the better. <laughs> you know, uh, you know a typical example is two housewives, uh, you know, having a conversation in a living room, and uh, on the house. Uh, the wife whose, uh, whose house it was uh, in, uh, her husband was trying to hang himself and uh, she would say to the neighbor, uh, ignore him, he's just uh, trying to get our attention. <laughs> <laughs> but the American humor is, uh, uh, the smarter you are, the better. So there's the t-shirt, I'm, I'm with this nerd, yeah. with an arrow, you know. Uh, so once I asked uh, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt at a, at a forum in, in Osaka, I said, what about German humor? Because I explained to him about these two British and Germany and, and uh, America. He said, there's no German humor. Because <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think it's a universal truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think he studied, when he was a young man, he studied in, in UK. You know, so he couldn't compare. You know, yeah. with, uh, uh, yes, to be fair, uh, that this, uh, uh, I, I won't be able to mention uh, any names. one particular. Uh, I like the way uh, Yang Zi mentioned this, those uh, foreigners who did the books in uh, bought Malaysia. Yeah. You know, we had Anthony Burgess uh, and so on. But the, the, those people also uh, brought some details you know, about yeah. our life. But, um, most, of, most of the people in Malaya at that time were not really important. What's important were the main uh, characters that they yeah. created. Absolutely. Yes, what about you? Is, is there someone who stands out for you? And I know you mentioned Tash, but um, anybody or, or even a genre that you think, you know, I wish people knew this about Malaysian writing? Well, uh, um, I'm actually I cannot think of anyone right off the boat because I was so busy enjoying Dr. Mark's answer. So I can't think of anyone who hasn't been discovered yet. But I think that there probably are um, a lot of young people who are ready to write and who are probably preparing their manuscripts right now or making their stop action, you know, Lego movies or whatever the new medium of the future will be. Um, I just wanted to jump in on what Dr. Bart said about the difference in humor between countries. So I'm in California because I married this Chinese guy from Los Angeles and I'm forced to live in America now, so which is a point of contention with my husband. And um, one, one of the things that when we first started dating, actually, I did not get a lot of his jokes. I did not find a lot of American sitcoms funny. And his first Christmas present to me which was something called the Big Book of American Humor. And I was so offended. I said, why? Why are you giving me this book? And he said, because I, I want you to understand American humor. And of course, I looked at him and said, it's not funny, it's not funny. None of this is funny. So I was just listening to your story, and I was just laughing, because I, I think that's, I think that is really true. You live at um, crossroads. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, to pick up on another point, that I think the things that inspires Virus are not necessarily um, local. In fact, things are a little bit different, you know, a little bit chaotic, a little bit strange. I actually find it more inspirational. And one of the things I have thought about over the years, you know, as in why is there so little written about Malaysia, about by Malaysians in the past, and I thought India actually has produced some wonderful writers, and they have a very rich and long history of that. Why is that? And some of my great inspirations are the people like Vikram Seth going to mystery. Many of them Indians who um, aren't necessarily based in India anymore, but they really write with, with great um, feeling and inspiration. And I also think there's a lot of inspiration from other Southeast Asian writers as well. So, great. 
Stephen, who's a political commenter, commentator that we should be watching? Is there anybody in your space that you think this is someone we should be oh, wow. following? Um, I think we've got a lot. Um, I don't have a special favorite. Now, you know, by virtue of my work, I have to read everyone, yeah? yeah. Uh, who? You see, some of them tend to write very Malaysia-centric work. Yeah. So if you want to talk about something that's very global, I mean, you have the Marina Mahades, but for the ones who are coming up, I would just say right now, I'm still watching out. Yeah. Um, there, was, there is one columnist who disappeared for a while and has come back. Uh, I found him, asked him to write for the mission side, and then he decided to go corporate, half his mm -hmm. I think he's writing better now. I think that one year out of this, and then now that he's in a corporate thing, it, the work, you can see there's a maturity, yeah? But again, he writes very mission-centric stuff. Uh, so right now, not really. Mm -hmm. I would just say that if you come to Malaysia, you switch on our websites and all that, just read yeah. the columns to get a sense of Malaysia. But I don't have a particular favorite or someone to watch out for, for now. Great, fair enough. We'll just watch this space. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, does anybody have a question that they would like to throw um, to our writers? I think we, do we have a microphone. We have mine. <laughs> anybody have a question for any of them?
But, uh, you know, I was thinking, I mean, I, I hope this can answer your question because I, I cannot go further. I was thinking that he was moving very fast, you know, and uh, ambassadors uh, from uh, Japan, for example, uh, from other parts of the world, whom I knew told me that this guy is moving very fast, you know, at that period. You know, yeah, some people say, you should slow down, slow down, please slow down. You know, this is Malaysia, you know, we, uh, we, sh we shouldn't say no to agriculture and so on. And um, I said to myself also, yeah, even until I moved back to Ipo with my wife and kids, uh, because I wanted to retire uh, in 1997, uh, which didn't work. Uh, so I said, why is the uh, Prime Minister going to give way for others, you know? Uh, maybe things will slow down. Of course he gave it to Abdullah Badawi, and things not only slowed down, he fell asleep. Just like me now, because uh, he went at a, you know, a later age. You know, now I, I feel sleepy very easily especially in the afternoon, you know. I mean, we, uh, you know, the years have taken a uh, toll, and, uh, you know, and so, uh, now we are back to uh, this uh, guy, uh, you know, uh, Najib, who is, uh, who, who seems to be energetic, you know, and uh, so uh, we are hoping for the best. But it was a very dull time during uh, the Badawi. And people were wondering, why don't you draw about him? Actually, I stopped drawing about uh, Abdullah because his wife passed away. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then I, I, my wife knew his wife and uh, we, we, uh, we knew each other. You know, he saw me a few times uh, at the Coliseum or at the Summer Club. Uh, and then they were an inseparable uh, couple. Uh, so I said, oh, I don't want to draw the then Prime Minister. I didn't want to disturb him. It's not funny anymore. You know, I'm not funny anymore. And so uh, uh, I think for those years that Tun Mahade was in power, the country was very exciting. We went to very, I'm sure Singapore also found Malaysia was very exciting then, you know. And, uh, well, this is what it's all about. Some people say, you know, you're going to high up, you're making so much noise, you are keep quiet, and they say you are too quiet, you know. So, we, I guess, uh, you never uh, stop people from talking. So, uh, I'll try and go back and read the Malay Dilemma again. Anybody else that want to weigh in on that? We'll move to another question. Any other questions from the audience? Nice that books about Asia actually sell. Um, I was told that maybe 20 or 30 years ago, um, you know, they were, it was quite a hard sell. And um, when I first wrote my book, which was uh, about the obscure folk practice of marrying the dead in a small Southeast Asian country, I actually thought, no one's going to publish this thing. Who cares, you know? Um, and it takes place in a town called Malacca, which most people outside of Malaysia or Southeast Asia have no idea about. So um, when I, um, my literary agent sent it out, I was really shocked that people, um, the publishers wanted to publish it. And she said, no, no, people are really interested in Asia. Uh, and, not, and actually, they are tired, in terms of fiction trends, they are tired of the Far East, which is Japan, um, China, because there's been a lot, and India actually, um, which is which has produced some superb work in the past, Nobel laureates and things like that. And so they are looking for different countries, and uh, Southeast Asia is very interesting right now. You know, not besides Malaysia, Cambodia, Singapore, etc. So it is great for young novelists. It's good. I mean, I'm not that young. I'm a middle-aged novelist. <laughs> I'm, I'm relatively new to the field. But it is good for young writers, and I always tell people who um, 
come and ask me about it. Like, oh, I have this story about my hometown, can I write it? And I always tell them, please, by all means, write what you find to be truly interesting. And I actually think it's good to be very specific because specificity breeds authenticity. Um, you know, when I was younger and I wrote, I realized that I wrote in a style of authors that I admired. So authors I really loved, like Chumpa Lahiri or Haruki Murakami. And then I realized that what I produced was a pastiche. It was a, a copy, in some ways fan fiction, of all these people. And you really have to find something that you know well in order to write. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean, I think, tied to geographic place, because one can write quite well about science fiction um, or fantasy or space opera, but there has to be something authentic in it which speaks to the audience, whether it's the authenticity of place or of feelings or of or of conflict, I think. Um, the beauty of fiction is that you can write about some very difficult things in different settings and surroundings, you can explore themes which have a, uh, which might make people quite uncomfortable otherwise. Um, so, I hope that helps, but thank you for your question. Any other? Feel free to jump in if you don't like. But, um, and that is something that I actually struggle with because, um, so when I was writing my book, which is a rather, uh, it's a book about the marriage of the dead. Um, and I, it, it came out of a lot of memories from my childhood and um, relatives, you know, people would be married to the dead and ceremonies that have happened. Um, when I was writing it, I actually felt like I did not want to exoticize it. And um, half of the book actually takes place in Chinese afterlife. So those of us who have watched big Chinese Hong Kong movies, like a Chinese ghost story and other things, will know this world well, which is a world of, it's not exactly the afterlife, but it is also a world of fantasy. And to Western audiences, it is really weird. You know, they think it's very strange. And so, because half my book is set in this place where um, the servants are made of paper, the houses are made of paper, etc., uh, when I was pitching the book, I actually got feedback from a number of literary agents, one of whom was a very famous agent in New York. And he said to me, look, I like your book. I don't like all this stuff about ghosts. I think you should just remove the whole afterlife, remove half your book, and let's just have it to be about this Asian woman who's has this unhappy arranged marriage and she's slowly going mad because none of this really <laughs> happens. And I thought, goodness, you know, um, first of all, nobody else would got back to me at that point. And I thought, okay, if no one gets back to me, then I have no choice, I will write that book. But to me, that book seems like a cliche. It feels that there are a lot of books about unhappy Asian women who are trapped in arranged marriages. And I also feel that for a lot of Southeast Asians, the spirit world is really real. Even if you don't necessarily believe it, um, people actually live out these customs. They, they would enact a marriage to the dead. You know, they have their whole ceremony um, and you'd spend your life as a widow to a man that would already die. So um, that actually came up quite early on as to whether um, or not the book should be more like the Joy Luck Club, which I don't really consider Asian fiction. I consider that Asian American fiction. Amy Tan and Lisa C, they have a completely different experience because um, they don't have a strong, I mean, I mean, that is not to say that their books aren't good because they are, I really enjoy them, they are great fiction. But I feel as a writer from Asia that their experience is very different because they only have one or two generations knowledge of the culture. Whereas if you live or you grow up in Malaysia or Singapore, wherever else it is, um, you're looking at you know, three or four generations of the fact that your you know, family came over in 1765. Um, and that makes for a very different story. So for writers like Amy Tan, when they write about Asian American writing, it is exotic. It is exotic because it is exotic to them. They are the second generation to whom their parents came from you know, Taiwan or whatever, and they do not understand their parents. So they're like, my mom's babbling on in Chinese and she's saying these things. To them, it is an exotic culture, and that is how it is treated. And that is how you will see a lot of mainstream global writing about the Asian experience. Um, for Asian writers, I think writers from India, from Sri Lanka, 
Um, that's really not quite the case. You will see a disconnect between generations, as you always do, but it won't be quite as exotic because you usually understand what your parents are saying and you sort of see where they're coming from. So, um, I hope that sort of answers your question, but I think it is a good question. Yeah. It is a very good question because the other tropes that you see with um, Asians appearing in literature tend to be very, very stereotypical. So, I think that's something we all struggle with. I just want to take that question to Patla as well, just to ask, how do you want people to read Kampong Boy now and in the future, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Dina raised a point about, you know, people not even relating to Kampongs anymore. Mm -hmm. So, when we pick that book up now and, and when we pick it up in the future, what do you want people to take away from it? Uh, well, it, it is uh, our identity, you know, uh, part of Malaysia is the Kampo, and we started off with Kampo, you know, and uh, I am lucky because I was born in one, and the Kampo is uh, usually, uh, of course, uh, by the river, and uh, it's a small community, and it's traditional, uh, it's got traditional houses, traditional, traditional way of living, and we practice our customs, and so on. And uh, of course, uh, this was a thing of the past, but this is what we are about. Someone like me is from that community. And uh, I want the young ones to know, uh, to, to know about their origins, you know. Uh, I was born in a house, I was not born at the uh, Sunda Hospital, you know. Uh, I, I was also raised uh, the traditional way. I was circumcised the traditional way using bamboo, you know, and there's no, uh, what do you call, uh, no uh, anesthetic, right? no anesthetic, only siri, you know, the uh, bitter leaf, uh, and the bitter leaf, and uh, the circumciser told me this is uh, from England, <laughs> chocolate from England. Uh, so we were fighting, there were five of us. I did this, uh, this story on, uh, on circumcision for the Malay uh, boy during my time, uh, which which made uh, my way to the to drawing in English because uh, this appeared in the Asia magazine in uh, early 1974. And so the traditional way of living, the customs, we have to remember them. Today we go to kampong, the kampongs in Malaysia, they are disappearing, and if they still exist, the houses. Uh, single story brick houses, you know, so uh, we, we don't know what kind of people we are uh, from actually. And the word kampong is a Malay word, and uh, uh, it's uh, of course in the 1950s uh, it was considered uh, if you use it the uh, wrong way, it, it, it symbolizes uh, backwardness. Uh, but today everybody wants to be a kampong. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's from originally from the 
bad names, uh, uh, that's where the Sioux Indian. And he told me originally the Indians in uh, North America uh, who live in the reservation, they don't like to, to go out of the reservation and they don't like to join what they call the white people uh, and join the adventure and uh, if somebody tries to do it, uh, they will try to pull him back or when they leave, they leave for good and he's one of them who, who, who said to me that he, uh, he left for good and he became a cartoonist in a, in a newspaper. So uh, we don't want that kind of mentality a tampon mentality like that. Mm -hmm. So, I really wish, because Malaysia is to be covered with concrete, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know we, we lost our greenery. Yeah. My kampong was, in, uh, in my book, the Kampong Boy, there was a monster which was a tindrich, you know, swallowing the land. Uh, now, uh, there's a cement factory, yeah. you know, and we are, uh, you know, those kampong people are breathing in uh, cement, you know, so, uh, well, the story, the sad story is endless. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, Yang Zi agreed with me that uh, if we live uh, uh, in a land of sorrow like India, you know, the, all is right. Uh, that's why, you know, we used to have a magazine called Asia Week, mm -hmm. and they used to have uh, English uh, short story competitions mm -hmm. annually, all run by the Filipinos. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Filipino, huh? because they are, they are all, uh, you know, having a very bad time, you know, it's really, I think it's not the uh, climate, it's not the uh, natural disaster, it's life in uh, Makati, in, uh, in Manila, you know, where you drive a jeepney and, you know, you are poor and so on, they, they produce fantastic uh, short story, right? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we might have time. What kind of those stories, uh, you know? My youngest brother is producing movies, uh, he directed movies, all those stories. I told him, you know, uh, I, I, you know I, I won't watch. He, he forced me to, you know, to attend the, the opening of, uh, you know, the screening of his movie, all about zombies. You know, and uh, it's supposed to be comedy. I didn't laugh. Uh, oh, and, uh, the latest is called uh, Zombie Kilang Disco. It's a uh, Disco Factory Zombies, you know. All that for me, you know, he's from a different, I think somewhere along the way we, uh, we are separated. But, uh, you see, when, uh, just, just briefly, uh, the, the character in your book uh, marries uh, somebody who is uh, already dead? Well, um, I'm trying to think how much we can give away, but she gets a proposal from someone who's dead. And actually, my grandparents all lived in a small town in Pera called Kampa, which is pretty close to Ipo. And when I was a child, um, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother there. And she was very old-fashioned, and she really did everything. Like, that means all the festivals, and, um, and as a child, I remember we had to make piles and piles of paper money for the dead, which is sort of like origami for the dead. So you have to move all these gold in God's special ways and, and they, you know, there was one for the ancestors and one for the gods and you know, help you if you get it wrong, you know, she'll be really mad at you. So um, there was a lot of helping her with that. And while I was doing that, I would look at all these banknotes which were the dead, which you can buy at most Chinese sundry shops. It says hell banknote. Mm. And I thought there must have been a lot of inflation in the world of the dead because it comes out millions now, it's like millions of dollars per note. And I always thought, what about all those poor dead people who died when they were still burning like one dollar notes? How are they surviving? Um, and people take this very seriously. My grandmother took this very seriously. I know lots of people who do. Who do. Um, and people would get buried with things they liked. Um, my friend's grandmother got buried with a helicopter and a lot of designer clothing because that was the sort of person she was. And you can also buy things like paper Louis Vuitton handbags, paper iPads, paper... Uh, you know, for some reason, a lot of Apple products are really <laughs> popular with the dead. But I always see it seemed like a very concrete idea. Um, and they were doing it, you know, they've been doing it for centuries. 
Um, and so I thought I would like to write about what, what happened and what happens when you take it. Yeah, well, don't be, you shouldn't reveal too much. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I look forward to reading it. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I, 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 I,